since the history of my house covers about 133 years, there's a lot to tell. For perspective, that's the presidential terms of U.S. presidents from Grover Cleveland to Joe Biden. Especially in this time of COVID, we have not been able to answer every question, so there are a few gaps in the story, but we were able to learn a lot. Joe just talked about the research process of learning the history, and I'm excited to now tell you about some of the people, stories, and the chronology that we discovered about my house. I will begin by sharing what I found out when we bought our house, since I'm sure that is where most of you would also begin on your own searches. Some of these things are what everybody learns in the paperwork when they buy a house, but we also had a few other discoveries that were unique to us. Sarah, you moved to slide two, there you go. The people we bought our house from in 1978, Floyd and Betta Bryan, gave us a photo negative for a photograph which they said was taken around 1906, and we had it developed. Recently, I ran that photo through the colorization process on the MyHeritage website that Mike just mentioned, which is the image on the right. You can see, especially in the colorized version, that there were several paint colors in 1906. The porch wrapped around the east side of the house. There was a palm tree in the front yard. There were seven to eight steps up to the front porch. There were no dormer or gable windows in the upstairs. And Broadway, or at least the sidewalk, was plain dirt. This is what 1408 Broadway looked like when we bought the house in 1978. You can see that the front porch had been lopped off. There are only two steps up to the porch and therefore the house sits much lower to the ground than in the 1906 photo. There are windows in the upstairs. The palm tree had been replaced by a birch tree and the house is painted all one color. Floyd and Betta told us that the house had been owned before them by her parents. Henry and Wilhelmina Ebert. So the house had been in Ebert family hands since the 1930s. They also told us that the kitchen was an early addition, as was the downstairs bathroom. The earliest kitchen had a big wood burning kitchen stove, which had an interior brick chimney, which you can see in the upper right hand photo. It fell down in the 1989 earthquake. Floyd and Betta also told us that Henry Ebert had moved the house over a few feet in the 30s when he realized that he had accidentally sold land that was actually under the house. It was moved just a few feet, just enough to get it over the property line, and that's when the house was put on a lower foundation and the porch was cut off. Floyd and Betta said that the house was originally the farmhouse for a small chicken ranch and had been part of a larger plot. They knew nothing about any odors before Betta's parents. We also saw on the deed documents the date of August the 4th, 1886, as when the property was first registered. That was the extent of what we knew at the beginning and all that we knew until this project. Here's the part that is unusual. When we first began renovation work and the first summer we lived here, we discovered quite a cache of items that amounted to an ad hoc time capsule. Here my husband is shown tearing out lath and plaster walls. When we did this, we were surprised and quite delighted by what came tumbling out, a random collection of unique items which apparently had been tossed into holes in the plaster through the years and then forgotten. Here's a partial list of what we found in our walls, a few of which are pictured. We found a dusty French language textbook published in 1897. There were 1905 and 1906 copies of Everybody's Magazine, as well as wallpaper fragments and sheet music from around then, a 25 cent edition of The Phantom Rickshaw by Rudyard Kipling. There was a 1916 How to Live Long booklet, a glass cruet with a silver top, the sleeve of a black dress with beading on the cuffs, a pair of very worn down Victorian shoes, a collection of old Valentines, 
the tag from a Montgomery Ward bicycle tire and other odd things. We saved all of these things, but had absolutely no idea how or even if they figured in the history of our house. Here are a few more details about a couple of the items we found that did prove to have connection to people who had lived here. One of the best preserved items we found was a July 1904 issue of Success Magazine. You can see it in the upper left. With this idealized cover image and the address label of L.C. Taylor, 325 Broadway, middle bottom still intact. What? Had somebody stolen this from a neighbor? Our address was 1408 Broadway, not 325. This magazine was folded in thirds as if someone intended to tuck it under their arm and take it to the nearest armchair. One of the main articles was how the czar earns his living. There were also two paperback Santa Cruz High School Trident books one dated September and the other November 1913. The November one, which is shown here, had Stella Ebert written on the title page. You can see that in the upper right. Ah, Ebert, that rang a bell. My husband and I had always been interested in researching the history of our house, but years went by without doing that. I first contacted Joe Michalak in November 2020 or December, and we began this project, knowing about almost nothing was about to change. Right away, Joe sent me very interesting and new to me information. For instance, he told me that my house had actually had four different addresses through the years, 325 Broadway in 1905 and earlier, 340s. 7 and 423 Broadway in 1917, 423 Broadway in 1928, and 423 and 1408 Broadway in 1950. That meant, for starters, that 325 Broadway was the address for my house in 1904, so that Success Magazine subscriber L.C. Taylor was a resident of my house. How exciting, the name of an early resident. Joe told you about several of the earliest buyers of lot four, five, and six of Effie and Crone, developers and real estate speculators. This deed of sale led us to the important deduction that a man named Edgar Chase Taylor was the owner who built our house. This deed proves that he purchased the property on December 28, 1887 from Thomas A. Sweeney. We think there was not a house on the property at that time. We still haven't been able to learn who, as an architect and or carpenter, built the house or exactly when it was built, but we deduce that it was built between 1888 and 1892, presumably on the earlier side of that range, because why would he buy the property and not build as soon as he could? This date range deduction is based on the two documented dates we found. That is the date when Edgar Taylor purchased the lots in December, 1887, and when he resided, presumably in a house, at this location in 1892. So the Taylors probably were the first residents of a brand new house at 325 Broadway around 1888 or 1889. Our house was probably built and designed to be an edge of town farmhouse by some anonymous carpenter. There were no building code requirements in 1888. We knew from Sanborn maps that there was only one house at the intersection of Broadway and Sumner in 1905, and we knew who lived there from an early city directory. This deed here adds the knowledge that that person, Edgar Taylor, was also the owner of the property. Here's the second part of our deduction, documented proof of Edgar Taylor's residency here. This entry for E.C. Taylor Teamster is a page from the Santa Cruz City Directory for 1892. 
This shows his residence at the corner, Broadway and Sumner, and is the earlier rec earliest record we have found that proves he lived here. In the 1891 city directory, Edgar C. Taylor Farmer was listed, but with no address. So he probably lived here then too, since we now know that he purchased the property in late 1887. I haven't been able to find a photograph of Edgar Chase Taylor, but I found this description of him on his 1892 voter registration record. Five foot, 10 inches tall, with a ruddy complexion, blue eyes, and brown hair. We found, as Joe mentioned, a very complete and well-sourced public member tree of the Taylor family posted on Ancestry.com by a man named Thomas Hoffman. His entries included many records, newspaper articles, and photos. Thomas put me in touch with another Taylor descendant, Lauren Ging. Through them, we learned the names of Edgar C. Taylor's wife and children and details about their lives. We're very grateful for their help. So I can tell you this Taylor family chronology. Edgar Chase Taylor was born March 13th, 1853 in Maine and his wife, Clara Alice Nee Martin was born about 1857 also in Maine and they were married there in 1879. They had moved to Santa Cruz by 1883 when their eldest daughter, Bessie Bell Taylor, was born. Their son, Leland Cecil Taylor, was born in 1884. Their third child, Reva Taylor, was born in 1892. As I just mentioned, Edgar's occupation shown on the 1892 city directory was Teamster, which then was a delivery wagon driver. This was also his occupation on the 1880 U.S. Census when he was still living in Maine. Edgar Taylor died on January 25th, 1894, just short of his 41st birthday. His death notice is on the bottom right. His widow, Alice, then inherited the property, lots four, five, and six at Broadway and Sumner. I have been unable to find a photograph of her either. In 1894, she was a 37 year old widow with three children under the age of 12, the youngest just 16 months old. And I think that she lived here with all three of her husbands, sequentially of course, and with her children and stepchildren for a total of about 32 years from around 1888 until she sold the property in 1920. Alice placed the ad shown on the bottom left on, in the Santa Cruz Surf on Saturday, June 9th, 1894. So it appears that six months after his death, she was selling what her deceased husband, Edgar, probably had used in his occupation as Teamster. Thanks to her descendants, we can share photographs of some of Alice's children. I'll mention a lot of birth and married names because I'd be very interested to hear if anybody in our audience recognizes a family connection. I also learned many facts about the adult lives of these Taylor children, but I'm mostly only going to include their childhood years here since that's when they lived in my house. Unfortunately, I didn't find a photo of oldest daughter, Bessie Bell Taylor. Bessie was born in 1883 and died in 1945. I would especially love to see her wedding photograph because according to the Santa Cruz Evening News, she wed Henry J. Zweifel at the family home at 347 Broadway on October the 14th, 1908. As far as I can tell, Bessie Taylor's wedding was the only one to ever take place in my house. Thanks to Leland's grandson, Lauren Ging, we have these three photographs of Alice and Edgar's son, Leland Cecil Taylor. Left is a baby photograph of him in 1884, 1894, it says 94, 95, it's 1884. And on the right is Leland as a young man, perhaps at around age 19, when he was the subscriber to that success magazine that we found in our walls. Yes, this is the name and address that matches. L.C. Taylor, 325 Broadway. 
the label on that July 1904 magazine. Very exciting cross verification. This photograph is the youngest Taylor child, Reva, was taken around 1898 when she was about six years old. It's possible that Reva, who was born September 23rd, 1892, when we know her parents were living here, might have been born in our house since home births were common at that time. Reva was only about 16 months old when her father, Edgar C. Taylor, died. At age 24, she married Edward Robert Edward Hampton in 1917. She became a registered nurse and lived in Oakland. I have photographs of Alice's other two children, another daughter and a stepson, and there were also two other stepchildren. But before I get to that, I will continue with the sequence of Alice's life. Alice had been a widow for about a year and a half when she married her second husband, Charles A. Cole, on June 25th, 1895. He was a widower with at least two children, Robert, age 11, and Irma, age 6, when they married. He was a New York native and worked as a carpenter. Alice and Charles Cole didn't have any children together. I would assume that Charles' children, Robert and Irma, joined the Broadway household, but I don't have any records to prove that or any childhood photos of them. If they lived here, that would mean that the Cole household included five children. I don't have a photo where Charles Cole is positively identified either, but his 1896 voter registration record gives this description. Five feet, 11 and a half inches tall, light complexion with blue eyes and brown hair. His address was Corner, Broadway and Sumner. So that record proves that he and Alice lived here during their marriage. Charles A. Cole worked as a carpenter at the powder mill located where Paradise Park is today. Gunpowder was manufactured there and he was killed in a horrendous explosion there on April 26th, 1898, which was a big event in Santa Cruz history. Telling about the powder mill explosion could fill a whole separate presentation. I've known for years about this famous explosion, which broke windows all over town and killed 13 men and boys. But I must say, I kind of look at it with new eyes now that I know that someone who was living in my house at the time died in that event. Most of the powder work em works employees were very young, but Charles A. Cole was 47 years old. So he might be the large man in the center of the group photo on the right, right behind the dog. Photo credit for this photo goes to Ma and Lisa Robinson. The picture of Reva Taylor that you just saw was taken right around the time that her stepfather, Charles A. Cole, was killed. And that 1898 date also means that Alice was widowed twice by the time she was 41 years old. Alice was a widow for a little over four years when she married for the third and final time. Her third husband, whom she married on June 9th, 1902, was William T. Boyd. He was a widower from Illinois with a four-year-old son. He was a barber and had a shop on Soquel Avenue. The upper left photo is W.T. Boyd with his one-year-old son, Earl, in about 1899, before he married Alice. Alice was shown as Mrs. C.A. Cole, 325 Broadway, on a 1902 city directory, obviously recorded before her June marriage. And her address with W.T. Boyd was always the Broadway house until 1920. So I believe she lived here that whole time since around 1888. On the right is Alice's stepson, Earl G. Boyd, at about the time she and his father were married. I will tell you more about Earl shortly. Alice and William T. Boyd welcomed a daughter, Belva Florence Boyd, on February 11th, 1903. Belva might also have been born at home. Thomas Hoffman, who posted the fam Taylor family tree, is a descendant of Belva. 
Belva married Ogle Merwin, a dentist, in 1926. She was also a registered nurse as an adult. All of Alice's children and stepchildren attended Galt School, which first opened in 1888 and is kitty corner from our house. There are many newspaper mentions of Alice's children being promoted through the grades and performing at various school events. Alice's son Leland was married in 1906 and her oldest daughter Bessie was married in 1908. But until those years, the Broadway house was probably a lively hub of family activity. I found many social write-ups in the local newspapers. Belva's birthday parties, sleepovers, watermelon parties, baking contests, vacations taken, and relatives visiting, many of which verified the changing Broadway addresses. In 1909, Alice's son Leland Taylor and his first wife, Etta Robertson Taylor, lived at 351, now 1416 Broadway, which was then next door. Leland and Etta's house was built sometime between 1905 and 1909 on the original lot four of Effie and Crone. Leland and Etta had two older children when their third baby died when he was only one month old. His death notice was printed in the Santa Cruz Evening News on October 27, 1909. Leland and Etta later divorced. His second wife, whom he married in 1912, was Blanche Parks Taylor. Leland's adult occupation was butcher. He died in a snowstorm traffic accident in February 1926 in Utah. On Monday, December 26, 1910, W.T. Boyd's barn was robbed at around 11.30 at night. This was front page news in the Sentinel on December 28th. It's amusing to read that the thieves were caught literally red-handed eating some of the stolen fruit preserves when they were arrested. Other articles told a darker part of the story, that the thief was the 14-year-old stepson of the real mastermind and culprit, and that the boy and his mother both testified to being beaten if they did not do as ordered by Mr. Fred Resimenis, the husband and stepfather. A policeman also reported that the thief's house on Effie Street has got a wagon load of what I believe to be stolen goods in it. As if Alice hadn't suffered enough with the deaths of two husbands and a baby grandson and a robbery, another very tragic event befell the Boyd family in June of 1913. Earl G. Boyd, the one shown in the earlier photos as a baby and a four-year-old, was Alice's stepson, the son of her husband, William Boyd. Earl Boyd, Lyle Hitchings, and George Dolan were chums, all popular and promising students at Santa Cruz High School. They were all good swimmers and together they had constructed a canvas canoe they christened Casey and which they often took out into the ocean. On Saturday afternoon, June 7th, 1913, these three friends were out in their canoe between the Whistling Buoy and Lighthouse Point, but were seen in distress at about 5.30 p.m. by a fisherman on the wharf. He rowed out in a skiff to try to rescue them, but couldn't find them. It came to be generally believed that the canoe was swamped in the heavy seas and the boys were thrown out and drowned. News of this tragedy was announced by this huge banner headline on page one of the Santa Cruz Evening News on Monday, June 9th, 1913. This was called the worst tragedy in Santa Cruz. At least eight bullet articles about the event appeared on that front page with the boys' identities, parents' names, and addresses shown, including Earl Boyd, sophomore at the high school, son of Mr. and Mrs. W.T. Boyd of 347 Broadway. The boys' parents were all on the wharf all night long, hoping desperately to hear good news. That Monday morning, Santa Cruz high school students were led out of school to aid in the search, 
and one party found the canoe at Lombardi's Beach, five miles up the coast. Many articles about the tragedy appeared in the following weeks. Headlines included, one more relic of Bay's tragedy comes to light. Bodies not yet given up by the sea and high school festivities called off. Fruitless searches went on for weeks. George Dolan's father offered a $100 reward, but as far as I can tell, none of the boys' bodies were ever recovered. Alice and W.T. Boyd and their 16-year-old daughter, Belva, were shown on the 1920 census, which was enumerated January 2nd, 1920, as still living at 423 Broadway. Alice worked as a storekeeper at a confectionery at 365 Soquel Avenue. W.T. Boyd was still a barber. Sometime later in 1920, they moved to 33 Sunnyside Avenue in Santa Cruz. They were still living there when Alice died on December 4th, 1928. And Grandpa Boyd lived there until his death in 1940. So Clara, Alice, Martin, Taylor, Cole, Boyd lived in my house from about 1888 to 1920 for 32 years. The 1920s would prove to be a problematic time at our property. I don't know what prompted the Boyds to move from Broadway to Sunnyside or exactly when they moved. Newspaper real estate notices show that Clara Farmer owned the Broadway property for five months from June 26, 1920, when she bought it from Alice Boyd until November 10th, 1920, when she sold it to Solomon and Grace Myers. I don't think she ever lived here. Solomon H. Myers and his wife, Grace E. Gilmore Myers, purchased lots four, five, and six of Effie and Crone in 1920 from Clara Farmer and operated a small poultry farm here. They were from Vermont and Solomon Myers had been a Baptist minister there, but didn't pursue that occupation here. Grace was Solomon's second wife, and she was 50 years old, and he was a 65-year-old widower when they were married on October 7, 1920, in Vermont. Their wedding clipping, printed in their hometown newspaper on October 7, 1920, indicated they would be going to Santa Cruz, California, where they will reside and where they will be at home after November 1st. I found them both shown on 1922 and 1924 city directories with Solomon's occupation as poultry man and the address of 423 Broadway. Solomon was also shown on 1922 and 1924 voter registration records with that same address and occupation. So things looked good for a while, but Solomon Myers died suddenly of a heart attack at age 70 on March 13th, 1925. During the excitement attendant upon a fire in his chicken brooder at 423 Broadway, as reported in the Santa Cruz Evening News, his death was the fourth that I count of a resident of my property at the time of death. Grace Myers was 55 years old when he died, and it appears that she tried for years to unload the property and had moved to Saratoga by 1930, maybe even earlier. Grace advertised needing to sell baby chicks only four days after Solomon's death and tried to rent the property in June, three months after his death. An entry for Grace E. Myers, widow of S.H. Myers, 423 Broadway, appeared in the 1925 city directory. I'm not sure how long Grace actually lived here after the death of her husband. It looks like she maintained ownership, but she definitely had renters from 1927 to 1930. 
From at least February to June 1927, the Thomas A. Gray family rented from Grace Myers and operated a poultry farm here. Several documents place the Gray family living here. This 1927 city directory, as well as several newspaper ads that ran in February and June 1927. The June ad announced that due to my health having failed, I am disposing of my little flock of poultry. The 1930 census when they were living on Soquel Avenue shows that the Gray family included a daughter named Georgia Gray and she figures in one of the sweetest stories about the things we found in our walls. Here's that story. One day in the 1980s, I was working out in my front garden and I noticed an old woman had parked across Sumner Street and was staring wistfully at my house. Eventually I spoke to her and she told me that she had lived in this house as a young girl. I asked her if her name could by any chance be Georgia Gray and she started crying. Remember my earlier report about items we found in the walls? I knew to ask her that question because I remembered that Georgia Gray was the name on some of the Valentines we had found in the walls. One even said to Georgia Gray from question mark, question mark, question mark, like it was from a secret admirer. The elderly lady who visited in the 1980s said she hadn't been back in town in many years. I invited her inside and she showed me where she said her sister was married in our front room. I gave her the Valentines that had her name on them, but I kept some of the others shown here. Postscript, I was excited to note on census records that Georgia Gray had a sister, Helen Gray, but alas, when I researched Helen's marriage, I learned that she married a man named Robley H. Lawson on August 12th, 1935, but the wedding was in the San Francisco home of her sister, Georgia Gray Young. So my visitor was mixed up about the memory of where her sister had been married. The George Nelson Greenwood family, which included his wife Hazel and their three children, rented from Grace Myers in 1928. George Greenwood worked as a lineman, electrician, and serviceman for Coast County's Gas and Electric. I don't think they continued the poultry farm business. Their entry on the 1928 city directory is on the left and the bottom right clipping shows that they were members of the Advent Christian Church. This social announcement was printed in the Santa Cruz Evening News on Tuesday, January 24th, 1928. And no, this Greenwood family is not related to our Shirley Greenwood. I asked her, wouldn't that have been a kick? I don't know how long the Greenwood family lived here, but by the time the 1930 census was enumerated on April 7th, 1930, another family was renting from Grace Myers. The 1930 U.S. Census shows that Jack Olmsted, his wife Celia, and their nine children, that's right, nine children, ages one to 19, lived at 423 Broadway, which they rented for $25 a month. They did not have a radio. Jack, 43, worked as a salesman at a gasoline station. The 1930 city directory also shows Jack and Celia Olmsted living at 423 Broadway. Jack's business was Olmsted Superstation, at 278 Soquel Avenue. I know that the Olmsted family lived here at least from April to July of 1930 because I found a clipping that oldest daughter Lottie was driving on July 14th, 1930 when she was involved in an auto accident at Broadway and Cayuga Streets. I can't imagine nine children living in this house, which would have been 11 people counting the parents. There was quite a flurry of neighborhood real estate activity reported in the Santa Cruz Evening News on Tuesday, August 11th, 1931. 
Mr. William Watson bought a six room bungalow at 183 Sumner Street from Mr. and Mrs. John Busby. And the Busbys bought the Grace Myers home of about one half acre at the southeast corner of Sumner and Broadway. Grace Myers must have been very relieved to finally sell the property in August of 1931 to John Busby and his wife, Clara. Their family included five children. There is an entry for John Busby living at 423 Broadway in the 1932 city directory. So I believe that they did live here, but only for less than a year, probably from around August 1931 to June of 1932. John Busby was a carpenter, but he apparently was unable to fulfill the financial obligations of his mortgage to Grace Myers. So the bank held an estate sale at the front door of the county courthouse, which was then what we remember as the Cooper House on June 20th, 1932. It looks like nobody bought the property for cash on that June day. So ownership of the property reverted back to Grace Myers. I didn't find any photos of Solomon or Grace Myers or of the Gray, Greenwood, Olmsted, or Busby families. Henry W. Ebert and his wife Wilhelmina Ebert purchased the property from Grace Myers on August 22nd, 1932, but they had lived in Santa Cruz since around 1907. Henry's extended Ebert family, pictured here, figured prominently in the history of Santa Cruz's east side. So now I'll back up a little to tell you more about their history. I learned so much about the Ebert family that I couldn't possibly include it all here. We could also do another whole presentation just about the Eberts. This photo is the family of German immigrants, William John Ebert and his wife, Emilia Louise Bartelt Ebert around the turn of the century. There were 13 children in the Ebert family in Merrill, Wisconsin, where the family had a grocery store. We thank Ebert descendants, Dale Bryan and his wife, Judy, who I believe are attending tonight from their home in Texas, as well as Carol Thornton for adding Ebert family photographs and stories for us to share. Henry Ebert is third from the right in the back row, and his brothers Theodore and Otto are in the left center of the back row. Here's the Ebert chronology. The first brother in the Ebert family to move to Santa Cruz was Otto in 1906, and he conducted what can only be called due diligence before coming. The Sentinel clipping on the left, published September 29, 1906, tells how Otto had subscribed to the Sentinel while he was deciding where in California to settle. Upon choosing Santa Cruz and arriving, Otto went into the newspaper office to change the address of his subscription from Wisconsin to his new Santa Cruz address. This is a good example of the kind of colorful and interesting stories that were often printed in the newspaper. On the upper right is Otto in one of his early Santa Cruz grocery stores on SoCal Avenue, probably either the Scherer building or the Rennie building. The photo on the lower right shows four generations of Otto's branch of the Ebert family in 1921. The patriarch, William John Ebert is on the right. Otto and his brother Theodore both had experience working in their father's grocery store in Wisconsin. After Theodore Ebert moved to Santa Cruz in 1914, Theodore and Otto opened what became a landmark east side business, the Quality Store, in June of 1915. When Theodore bought the property for an initial investment of $1,200, it was a hayfield with an old picket fence around it and a well in the center. And their business friends predicted they would not last six months since it was so far out of town at Seabright and Soquel, where Lillian's restaurant is today. 
At first, Theodore managed the dry goods department and Otto presided over the grocery department. Their store became quite a local institution. Like the powder mill explosion and Ebert family history, there could be another entire presentation about the history of the quality store. Henry William Ebert and Wilhelmina Kruger Ebert were married May 11th, 1895 in Merrill, Wisconsin. They moved their family of six children to Santa Cruz sometime between 1907 and 1909. They had 11 children in all, but only eight lived to adulthood. Their last four children, including youngest daughter, Betta, were born in Santa Cruz. Henry was a carpenter. He didn't work in the Ebert family store with his brothers, but he did work constructing the store buildings and he built Theodore's house, which is still in Ebert family ownership at Hanover and Seabright. Later, Henry worked for 17 years as a carpenter at Saul's Tannery, built grandfather clocks and worked as a salesman in a leather goods store. Henry and Wilhelmina had lived in Santa Cruz for decades before they bought the Broadway property. This photograph was taken in 1930, about two years before that purchase. At that time, they lived just around the corner at 174 Seabright, now 1407 Seabright. So they certainly were familiar with the neighborhood. Henry and Wilhelmina Ebert's youngest daughter, Betta Irene Ebert, married Floyd Milton Bryan on May 11, 1935, which was her parents' 40th anniversary. This photograph was taken in the front yard of the Ebert family home at 423 Broadway. Note the palm tree, which is the same one that was seen in that 1906 photograph. On their marriage record, Floyd worked as a mechanic and Betta was a telephone operator. Floyd served in the Naval Reserves from 1931 to 1935. On July 4th, 1937, Floyd and Betta's oldest son, Gary Harvey Bryan, was born in Glendale, California. When Floyd and Betta's second son, Dale, was born in 1942 in Santa Cruz, Floyd was, according to the newspaper birth announcement, employed as a mechanic at the Palo Alto Airport. During World War II, Floyd worked as a civilian mechanic at Fort Ord. This is the family of Henry and Wilhelmina Ebert in December 1937. Their seven daughters and one son are in this photo, which was also taken in the front yard of the family home at 423 Broadway. And you can again see that same palm tree. Henry and Wilhelmina celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary on May 11th, 1945. The photograph on the bottom left shows their family at their party. Henry and Wilhelmina lived at 423 Broadway from 1932 until 1946 for 14 years. Floyd and Betta Bryan and their two sons, Gary and Dale, moved into what is now our house in March of 1946. At that time, Betta's parents, Henry and Wilhelmina, moved just around the corner to 710 Sumner Street into this home which was made over from a former chicken farm building. The building had more recently been Henry's workshop and garage. It was torn down in 1960 and a triplex is there now. Henry died August 22nd, 1947 at age 79 and Wilhelmina died on July 26th, 1958 at age 83. Floyd and Betta Bryan bought the Broadway house after Wilhelmina's death, but had actually lived here since 1946. Floyd Bryan had worked as a mechanic since he was a teenager, but the first gas station that he owned from about 1946 to 1953, pictured on the upper left, was at Soquel and Pacheco. Betta and Floyd are pictured at that station in the bottom left photograph. And the photograph on the right is of Floyd's last gas station, which he operated from 1957 to about 1971 at Ocean and Barson Streets. 
My husband, Robert Hagopian, and I purchased 1408 Broadway from Floyd and Ben O'Brien in June of 1978. They had lived here for 32 years, from 1946 to 1978. The combined Ebert and Bryan ownership and residence spanned a total of 46 years, 1932 to 1978. Our two daughters, Alyssa and Chandra, were 12 and six years old when we moved in. This has now been our family home for 43 years. We have undertaken many renovation projects over the years. Floyd and Betta still lived in the Santa Cruz area after we bought the house, and Floyd came by several times to check out our progress. One time, noticing that we were ripping out the god-awful black with yellow veins linoleum in the kitchen, he laughed and said that his father-in-law had bought that linoleum used from Lease Department Store downtown in 1934. It was called Battleship Linoleum, and it still wasn't worn out. It was just ugly. Now I would like to tell you about what I call the fun research. This was researching a couple of the newspaper clippings we found in the walls and trying to figure out how or if they figured in our house's history. One clipping was this one telling about the elopement of Miss Iris Mitchell and Rex Rice. The amusingly old fashioned language tells that they slipped away in Ned Rice's Buick at 5.30 o'clock that very morning, no date shown however, and that the bride looked adorable in a dark blue taffeta gown edged with white and a pretty poke bonnet hat of the tan and blue shades. One of the first items Joe sent to me was the companion piece article on the right, which he found on newspapers.com. It tells that the guests at a shower for Iris each crocheted around the edges of a washcloth for her, and that along with lovely bath towels, the whole set was presented to Iris by the hostess, Miss Beulah Kearns, in a blue and white laundry bag. The shower article appeared in the Santa Cruz Evening News, June 13th, 1916. And it turns out that the date of the elopement and wedding was June 24th, 1916. Rex and Iris Rice apparently had a long and happy marriage. They lived in Douglas, Cochise County, Arizona, where his family had large interests in lands, oil wells, and brokerage. They visited Iris's sister Violet, Mrs. George Cardiff, in Santa Cruz often. Rex and Iris had two children, a son and a daughter. Rex died in 1947, and Iris returned to Santa Cruz after his death and lived here for the last 30 years of her life. She died in 1977 at age 87. I found a tree on Ancestry.com, which includes them. It has many resources shown, but no photos. And the person who posted it did not reply to my inquiry. I'd love to show you a photo of Iris and Rex, but alas, I can't. I presume that the reason this clipping was saved was that someone who lived here knew Iris Mitchell as a PE teacher at Santa Cruz High School where she worked and admired her. Who could have lived here and been a student at Santa Cruz High around 1916? Belva Florence Boyd, daughter of William T. Boyd and Clara Alice Boyd, fits that description. She would have been 13 years old and in high school in 1916. Another mysterious clipping found in the walls was an obituary. The fragment that we found shown on the left did not show the date it was published or even the full name of the deceased, but did include the names of her two husbands, A.J. Collimore and Captain Harrison Jones. Her second husband had been a Civil War veteran and she died at age 68 and was a mother. Armed with those facts, this is what I learned. Her first name was Ellen Nee Collins. She was born in Maine about 1841 and died July 28, 1909 at age 68 in Santa Cruz. Her first husband, also born in Maine, was A.J. Collimore. They married in 1866 
and moved together to Santa Cruz. They had one son, Albert Colomar, born 1867. They divorced and Ellen married Captain Harrison Jones on June 12, 1870 in Los Angeles, where he was a revenue collector. Harrison Jones was born around 1834, served in the 9th Minnesota Infantry Regiment during the Civil War, and by gallant conduct, won his way up to the position of a captain. He was wounded in the Civil War and actually died of those wounds at age 35 on November 10th, 1872. Civil War pension records show that Ellen A. Jones, widow of Harrison Jones, applied for a widow's pension January 18th, 1873. Ellen returned to Santa Cruz after Harrison Jones's death. She lived at Bayside Avenue where she died after a lingering illness in 1909. In addition to this obituary, I found two other prominent write-ups about her death in the Sentinel and even another one in the Evening News, which I think attests to her local renown. The headlines on these were, Death of an Old Resident and Good Woman Passes Away. One called her a pioneer of Santa Cruz. And the ending of our fragment said, she came to Santa Cruz in the year Lincoln was first elected president, coming by way of the Isthmus of Panama. Mrs. Jones saw Santa Cruz grow from a village to a thriving city and her reminiscences of early days and the war stories of her husband were most interesting. It doesn't appear that Ellen or anyone in her family ever lived in our house, but my guess about why the clipping fragment survived was that she may have known the Taylors who did live in our house and were also from Maine. Perhaps they had known each other back home or had made acquaintance as fellow Mainians in Santa Cruz. So rather like Ellen Jones, our house has seen Santa Cruz grow from a village to a thriving city. It has stood at the corner of Broadway and Sumner for around 133 years. My husband and I like to think that we've been as good and faithful stewards of the property as the Eberts and Bryans and all who came before them to the Taylors were and that our home will be around for more families to enjoy for many years yet to come. It was not designed by a prominent architect or was or ever owned by anyone famous. The people who lived here lived ordinary lives and this is an ordinary house. They went to work, raised their children, celebrated milestones and birthdays, withstood storms, fog, sun, even the occasional snowstorm, tended the gardens, maintained the house and did their bits during war times. They experienced the joys, sorrows, pleasures, and even some tragedies of normal life here in my house. Because of them and enduring through the passage of time, our house has been woven into the historic tapestry of our town.